Surpassing 100,000 confirmed deaths, the quarter million mark, 300,000 COVID death threshold. Those we've lost now topping 500,000. COVID-19 put our world in a standstill. Gone were the concerts, sporting events, and other large gatherings. In came masks, social distancing, quarantining, and hand sanitizer. So much hand sanitizer. Even as we cross the year-long anniversary of COVID, we are still gravely dealing with its effects. Allow me to take you back where it all started. March 11th, 2020, when we heard these words. Is the game tonight has been postponed. This was the night when Rudy Gobert of the Utah Jazz tested positive for COVID-19 and subsequently decided to do this. Fans calmly left the stands, but little did they know that the landscape of sports and society would significantly change. At first, students were overjoyed at the thought of an extended spring break. We kept hearing it'll be over in two weeks, all we have to do is stay home for an extra two weeks and we'll be back on campus, according to former President Trump's 15 days to slow the spread campaign. Well, two weeks quickly turned into two months, and two months transitioned into an indefinite time frame, one where we are still waiting for a return to normal, whatever that means. Fast forward to over a year and over 500,000 deaths later, the COVID-19 pandemic is still here. We are still wearing masks, social distancing, and taking remote classes. But it appears there exists a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel. Case numbers have been on a steady decline in the past months, and places like Iowa hit a milestone of being the first day since the start of the pandemic that they reported zero new deaths and zero new ICU hospitalizations. A large reason for this optimism has been the introduction of the COVID-19 vaccination program. With three readily available vaccines at Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson, and over 154 million people receiving their first dose, and over 56 million people being fully vaccinated, we all see a path toward a reconceived normal. But while vaccine distribution continues to ramp up, as the Biden administration was able to put out 200 million vaccines within the first 100 days of office, people of color are falling behind in the nationwide rates to get vaccinated for COVID-19. The COVID-19 vaccination rollout has widely been seen as a success in the United States, with upwards of 4 million people getting shots in their arms every day. This high yield has allowed for us to dream about the days of large gatherings without masks or social distancing in the near future. But the pandemic continues to expose the failures of our healthcare system to address equity, which is why the disparity between white Americans and minorities in vaccine distribution cannot be overlooked. Most metro areas are facing disproportionately low vaccination rates among groups hardest hit by the pandemic. For example, in Washington, D.C., residents in predominantly black neighborhoods have had the highest COVID death rates, but are now receiving the fewest vaccines. At the start of the rollout, the slots were overwhelmingly taken by residents from far more affluent parts of the city on a first-come, first-served basis. The district's first attempt at creating a vaccine appointment system was to open all appointments at midnight every morning and allow users to select their appointment time. Well, as you probably know, this led to a huge surge of users frantically clicking at the same time all trying to get an appointment. This means that people with Wi-Fi, the best Wi-Fi, which are generally white people who live in more affluent neighborhoods, had a far greater chance at landing an appointment, leaving people of color, the people who need it most, out of luck. We have also seen similar examples in New York, Chicago, and Michigan, where residents must navigate a complicated sign-up process requiring solid Wi-Fi, email, and often a good measure of luck. In fact, one Chicago doctor compared their vaccine distribution process to playing the Hunger Games where people with more money and resources, white people, have a much better chance at being successful. In fact, despite the higher COVID infection rates for Black and Hispanics in Chicago, they have received a combined 38% of vaccine doses, while white residents have received more than half, even when the city's population is 30% Hispanic and 30% Black, compared to 33% white. People of color are more likely to be poor, work in industries that expose them to the virus, live in crowded spaces, and have chronic health conditions which further emphasizes their need for vaccination. And this won't be possible without an equitable vaccine distribution process. While I just mentioned the current discriminatory and inequitable vaccine process, one that crowds out poor communities of color who don't have access to the same technologies and institutions as the affluent white communities do, 
the history of vaccine hesitancy within communities of color must also be considered a contributing factor to why minorities are getting vaccinated at lower rates than whites. The entirety of the American medical system was built on the backs of black slaves and continues to affect how doctors treat patients today. There exists a long history about violent medical experimentation on black slaves, from the Tuskegee experiment to the Mississippi appendectomy and everything in between, people of color have been seen as the guinea pigs of the American health system. Slavery and American gynecology were the vessels that poured life and death into black women's lives. In 1808, when the federal ban on importing slaves from other countries took effect, the focus of American slavery quickly moved from those who were living to becoming dependent on domestic slave births. This meant that slave owners wanted to promote the healthy births of slave children by any means necessary which resulted in slave mothers falling victim to harsh medical experimentation. Understanding and treating gynecological problems in female slaves became particularly important. Yet, most might not know that pregnant enslaved women lived in a society that invented and maintained practices that treated mother and child as separate entities. The so-called father of modern gynecology, James Sims, exemplified this notion as he played a crucial role in developing pioneering tools and surgical techniques related to women's reproductive health. It must be noted that Sims' research was conducted on at least a dozen different enslaved black women without anesthesia. He would perfect the technique on a black enslaved woman in America then offer the procedure in Europe to affluent white women with anesthesia. Sims operated under the misconceived racist notion that black people had a higher pain tolerance than whites and knowingly injured and killed black women for the quote-unquote greater good of modern medicine. It's not just black women who have fallen victim to a history of medical experimentation and racism. Black men have as well. The Tuskegee experiment began in 1932 at a time when there was no known treatment for syphilis. After being recruited by the promise of free medical care, 600 African American men enrolled in the study. 399 who had syphilis and 201 who did not. The study aimed at assessing the full progression of the disease. The men were monitored by health workers, but only given placebos such as aspirin and mineral supplements to treat the disease. Despite the fact that penicillin became the recommended treatment for syphilis in 1947, some 15 years into the study. Researchers convinced local physicians not to treat the participants, and instead research was done at the Tuskegee Institute, which gave researchers the ability to treat these black patients however they wanted without backlash from local physicians. Researchers provided no effective care as the men died, went blind, or insane, or even experienced other severe health problems due to their untreated syphilis. In fact, by the time the study was uncovered by the Associated Press in 1972, 28 participants died directly from syphilis, 100 more had passed away from related complications, at least 40 spouses had been diagnosed with syphilis, and the disease had passed on to 19 children. As a result of both the history of medical experimentation on black bodies and what we currently see, where white people are getting vaccinated as high as three times that of people of color due to circumstances such as having good Wi-Fi, many African Americans have developed a lingering, deep mistrust of public health officials and vaccination programs. I mean, who can blame them? Especially if our medical system continues to employ racist beliefs. In fact, a 2016 study found that medical students and residents held false beliefs about biological differences between blacks and whites. 25% agreed that blacks have quote-unquote thicker skin than whites, all ideas that stem from James Sims. The persistence of racist medical beliefs and their association with ongoing racial disparities in treatment and patient outcomes represents a major challenge for 21st century American medicine and is a largely contributing factor to the disparity in vaccine distribution between whites and people of color. How can these people trust a medical system that continues to employ racist ideals? How can they trust these vaccines when they've constantly been lied to and experimented on? This is a question our medical system must address. Whether we like it or not, there is a problem. People of color who have lived through medical experimentation and severe medical discrimination and racism are still facing those challenges today. In order to address these ongoing disparities, we as a society will have to re-examine the incomplete or misleading historical narratives. For so long, Sims was praised in American medical societies, literature, and textbooks that largely ignored the racist assumptions and institutions that made his achievements possible. We need to change how medical schools educate students about racial bias as one strategy to achieve more equal healthcare outcomes. A majority of medical students, people who are responsible for keeping others alive, should not still believe in racist ideals promoted by Sims. 
but then again, it's not their fault. It's the fault of the institutionalized racist nature of our medical system that continues to persist in our world today. Our medical professionals must prioritize vaccine distribution to zip codes that have been most severely affected and that have high indexes of economic hardship. Vaccine distribution channels should partner with local healthcare institutions, community organizations, and other trusted sources to promote vaccine awareness and uptake within local communities, with particular attention to institutions and organizations that serve communities of color. Finally, it is truly on all of us to understand the apparent racial disparities not just in vaccine distribution, but in our medical system in general. If we are all cognizant about that and do our best to educate ourselves about the continued discrimination people of color face in the medical realm, Maybe one day we can truly create a system where we are all considered equal. Because as much as we want to think we are out of the woods, there are still problems that people of color will continue to face until we all come to a collective understanding to educate ourselves and become activists for a more equitable medical system, a more equitable society, and a more equitable world for all of us.